Welcome everyone. It's great to see everybody here in this room. Enjoy your lunch, please. And also uh, help me welcome our colleagues that are looking at this uh, online. Hello, on the virtual world. We have uh, several people um, watching uh, as a webinar. Also, this uh, presentation will be recorded and uh, saved and uploaded in our uh, Facebook uh, webpage. Welcome, everyone. I want to start with um, land acknowledgement. My name is Gaspar Rivera Salgado. I'm the director of the Center for Mexican Studies here at UCLA. And the Center for Mexican Studies at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tonga people. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, webinar will be recorded and, uh, and we have very good microphones here in this room. So I'm gonna ask uh, folks here in the room to try to stay quiet. I know we're enjoying a great lunch. So um, uh, let's enjoy that. Uh, we're in for a real treat today. Um, and I'm gonna ask a colleague of mine, Patricia Arroyo Calderon, to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Professor uh, Arroyo Calderon is in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and she will introduce our guest speaker. So let's welcome Patricia. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Gaspar, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to join uh, Gaspar in thanking all the units on campus that have made possible the celebration of this event uh, today, which have been the uh, Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Center for Mexican uh, Studies, the Latin American Institute, and also the Institute for Research in Labor and Employment, and a very special uh, shout out, oh, como se diga. <laughs> <laughs> thanks especially to Ariadne Barrera for getting everything ready uh, so perfectly as usual. And I would also like to thank everyone here today. Thank you for being here uh, with us, both to the attendees who are with us here uh, physically in Bunch, but also to the people who have joined us uh, via Zoom. I have to say that I am particularly happy to introduce today's speaker who is uh, Professor Monica Garcia Blizzard, because apart from being a very brilliant scholar in the field of Mexican film studies, she's also a dear friend of mine. So I am truly excited to welcome you to UCLA, uh, Monica. So let me introduce her. Monica Garcia Blizzard is an assistant professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Emory University in Atlanta. Her research interests lie at the intersection of film studies and Latin American cultural studies with a focus on race, marginality, and national identity in Mexican cinema. She has published book chapters in edited volumes addressing film genres such as El Melodrama Indigenista and analyzing topics regarding race and class privilege in contemporary Mexican film. She has also published several scholarly articles on early Mexican ethnographic film on Mexican classic movies such as Macario, for example, by Roberto Gavaldón, and on 21st century box office of his hits like Las Niñas Bien, right? Her work has been published in prestigious academic journals, including studies in uh, Spanish and Latin American cinemas, Latin American and Caribbean ethnic studies, Mexican studies, and Revista Canadiense Estudios Hispanicos. But this afternoon, Monica Garcia Blizzard is going to be talking about her recent book that you can see on the screen, the cover, and physically you can see it here. If somebody wants to take a look, just please uh, go ahead. Um, her recent book is titled The White Indians of Mexican Cinema, Racial Masquerade Throughout the Golden Age, and has been published uh, last year in 2022 by SUNY Press as part of their series in Latin American cinema. In her book, Professor Garcia Blizzard examines a very peculiar trait of Mexican film during the Golden Age uh, and beyond. The casting of white Mexican actresses and, to a lesser extent, white Mexican actors to perform the central roles in indigenous-themed films. By closely analyzing 20 features produced between the decades of the 1930s to the 1960s, Garcia Blizzard argues that this type of racial masquerade uh, that she terms whiteness as indigeneity, and she will speak about that, I'm sure, 
functioned as a privileged visual site for the complex racial legacies of colonialism. And the ambiguous discourses regarding the place of indigeneity in post-revolutionary Mexico converged and coalesced. In so doing, Professor, Gar uh, Professor Garcia Blizzard demonstrates how cinema has mediated discourses and imaginaries about race and gender in contemporary Mexico, and how, more often than not, has reproduced racist tendencies that associate whiteness with beauty, desirability, and stardom. So I yield the floor now to Monica Garcia Blizzard, who will be lecturing us precisely about these topics, right? In her talk titled Racial Masquerade in Mexican Cinema, Whiteness, Indigeneity, and Transnational Stardom. And please help me in offering uh, Monica a very warm welcome to UCLA. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for welcoming me to UCLA. I am truly delighted um, and honored to be able to be in your presence and share this work with you. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank Patricia Arroyo Calderon and Gaspar Rivera Salgado um, for their invitation, as well as all of the entities involved um, in sponsoring this event and all of the people involved in putting it together. I know that these things take a lot of work um, and also require special a commitment on your part to actually be physically present here um, and as well as those who are joining us on zoom so my talk today of course is taken from my book um, and being that this is just one talk i obviously cannot convey all of its contents to you so i've decided to uh, sort of strategically choose what i'm going to share with you and and therefore i will organize my talk in the following way um, i'm going to spend the first half of the talk explaining my theorization of the filmic trope that is the book's main concept and its organizing principle and in many ways it's, its primary theoretical theoretical and conceptual contribution um, and its organizing principle and then I'm, i will move on to exploring two examples from two different chapters to try to flesh out how this trope uh, plays out in in similar but yet uh, distinct ways according to different discourses and objectives okay. When many US and European spectators first encounter mainstream Mexican films and telenovelas, their reaction is frequently one of bewilderment. Often, these spectators cannot help but ask something to the effect of, why is everyone so white? What they mean, of course, is that the predominance of people with European epidermal schemas in film and television produced in Mexico clashes forcefully with their own racialized understanding of Mexicanness and their often unquestioned acceptance that with respect to themselves, Mexicanness is radical alterity. My book addresses a specific display of the ubiquity of whiteness in Mexico's audiovisual landscape and one that speaks to the intensity with which the showcasing of whiteness is inextricably tied to colonized notions of beauty and desire its historical pervasiveness, even in fiction films that explicitly claim to represent indigeneity. This study builds upon the excellent existing scholarship pointing to the racial politics in Mexican cinema during the golden age, roughly from the mid 1930s to the mid 1950s, a period of film production frequently credited with having a profound impact on Mexican culture and society. Expanding upon the valuable work of scholars such as Joanne Hirschfield, Charles Ramirez Berg, Andrea Noble, Dolores Tierney, among others, this study examines the duration of a local idiosyncratic form of racial masquerade that I term whiteness as indigeneity. From a decolonial perspective grounded in the history of race relations in Mexico, this study elucidates how throughout the golden age, the white Indians of Mexican cinema manifest the unresolved tension between two ideological formations. On the one hand was the government's 20th century post-revolutionary discourse that symbolically celebrated indigeneity. And on the other was the persistent long-standing valorization of a local construct of whiteness, which began with colonialism and was transformed through subsequent discourses of modernity during the 19th and 20th centuries. As a result of this tension, whiteness as indigeneity is the limit case of the racist norms that have structured audiovisual production in Mexico. Like its hemispheric cousin, blackface, whiteness as indigeneity is characterized by what Stam and Spence have called a tendentiously flawed mimesis. However, instead of seeking to ridicule the racialized subject, the Mexican trope, whiteness as indigeneity, works in the opposite direction, infusing the racialized subject with the dignity and desirability 
that coloniality confers upon whiteness. The obvious fact that this phenomenon is a breach of indexicality, often a point of contention which within many discussions about race and representation in cinema, is not this book's primary focus. In other words, the primary purpose of this book is not merely to point out that the actors playing indigenous people in Mexican cinema are not themselves indigenous people. Rather, this book interrogates the existence of a pervasive racialized visual logic in Mexico that makes this whitening approach to visualizing indigeneity and society in general, the rule in the local context. The method used here to interrogate this phenomenon, a constant across periodizations of Mexican cinema, which are usually used to explain stylistic changes, is to critically engage the multiple discursive functions of whiteness that the cinematic in, in the cinematic representation of indigeneity in Mexico. So I'm going to move now to discuss specifically how I'm using the word whiteness. It's a word that gets used often, and for me, it's very important that there be conceptual precision, precision in how I'm using it, um, and the valences it carries in my work specifically. My treatment of whiteness in Mexico refers to a person's ability to locate themselves on the right side of what Walter Mignolo has termed modernity coloniality. This, according to him, that is the set of diverse but coherent narratives produced by the Western Christian version of humanity, complemented by secular degotting narratives of science, economic progress, political democracy, and lately globalization. In the Mexican context, modernity coloniality has constructed indigeneity as the bane of these discourses, fixating on the following as points of supposed inferiority in various stages. Indigenous paganism, alternative ways of knowing, models of economic subsistence, communal organization, apathy toward the nation and its supposed democracy, protections for local economies, etc. Furthermore, as Satya P. Mohanty has argued, the process of racialization not only creates stereotypes of the colonized as other and as inferior, but the colonizer too develops a cultural identity that survives well beyond the formal context of colonial rule. In other words, the ongoing process of pejoratively racializing the colonized necessarily also yields the fabrication of a shifting but always privileged category of whiteness defined by its correlation to the current regime of modernity. To name this aspect of whiteness, I borrow and expand a term elaborated by Latin American philosopher Bolívar Echeverria, blanquitud. For him, blanquitud refers to an individual's internalization of a specific discourse of modernity, the puritanical capitalist ethos that values above all else a high degree of productivity and the external material wealth that such productivity ideally yields within that ethos. For my purposes in this book, Blanquitud refers not only to this puritanical capitalist ethos, the current regime of modernity that Echeverria has brilliantly theorized, but also to the previous discourses of Western modernity that have taken root in Mexico beginning with the Spanish conquest and which continue to exist in residual forms. In this sense, the discursive and performative dimension of whiteness that I refer to as blanquitud is an aggregate of the discourses of Western modernity in Mexico. At the same time, however, whiteness and indigeneity are not merely discursive or performative positionalities, but ones with a very real embodied component, which imposes limits to performativity for those with racialized epidermal schemas. In order to refer to the quality of having genealogical ties to Europe and an epidermal schema that is read as European, this book uses the term blancura. The position of whiteness as the norm, um, and of course, this is you know, theorist Richard Dyer's famous argument about how whiteness operates in Hollywood cinema, right? That it is the norm, right? The position of whiteness as the norm in Mexican film and media is particularly perverse in light of the country's majority mestizo demography. The degree of mediatic distortion carried out by this norm and the virulence with which it is defended confers upon Mexican film and media's privileging of whiteness a unique ideological force that this book uncovers. <laughs> 
That ideological force is the coloniality of power, and more specifically, dynamics that I refer to as the colonization of desire and subjectivity. In his well-known 1952 text, Black Skin, White Masks, Franz Fanon suggests that the prohibition of sexual relations and marriage between Black men and white women during the colonial period in the Antilles could cause some Black men to experience desire toward the white woman because an intimate relationship with her came to symbolize both redress for colonial subjugation and acceptance within white society. When discussing the Black Antillean woman's desire to couple with a white man, Fanon suggests that the inclination is rooted in a wish to whiten and therefore presumably improve the prospects for future children. He also suggests that marrying a white man is a way to definitively disassociate oneself from blackness and approach a more consolidated and convincing white identity. In a similar vein, Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized highlights the desire to marry the colonizer as an extension of the colonized strategy to become like his oppressor by adopting everything from the colonizer's world as superior. Both Fanon and Memi reveal that in colonial and post-colonial contexts, sexual attraction and desire are far from arbitrary occurrences and can be understood as racialized phenomena. Of course, I do not mean that the colonized are never considered to be sexually desirable, but that the overwhelming tendency to exalt whiteness as desirable in these contexts has a basis in colonial subjugation. Furthermore, as Fanon and Memi argue, the way in which colonialism upholds the colonizer's body as more desirable contributes to a process of self-loathing in the colonized. And this fact is evidenced in various attempts at physical whitening alongside the broader processes of socioeconomic and cultural whitening. While the history of interracial marriage in Mexico has its own historical specificities, and I do address those in the book, I don't have time to do them here, but if you're interested, please look them up there. Um, the experience of colonialism produced similar results to those described by Fanon and Memi. This racialized desire for white bodies has been documented throughout the history of Mexican cultural production. Mexican cinema, television programs, and advertisements reinforce the supposed aesthetic superiority and desirability of whites to this day. Although I do not exclude that Mexican films have also sought to imitate conventions of whiteness in European and American films, what I wish to point out is that because beautiful bodies and faces are almost <clears throat> always requirements for film stars, especially for women, whiteness in Mexican film production has also been predominant because of the local process of colonization of desire, which dictates that beauty is white according to a very specific set of bodily standards within the context of the local Mexican racial formation. I'm just gonna grab some water very quickly. <laughs> Fanon also describes how the, colonized sub, how the colonized subject's exposure to racialized discourses in comic books and history books impacts him, effectively alienating the subject from himself through a kind of discursive brainwashing, the colonization of his subjectivity. He identifies with the white protagonist, the victor, and becomes complicit in the othering of pejoratively racialized subjects in these um, story worlds, right? He therefore associates the Senegalese with, quote, the wicked Negroes, end of quote, within the texts, and attributes to himself a white subjectivity, disavowing his own uh, African ancestry. Fanon's identification of how the colonized are coerced to identify with whiteness is not only a characteristic of the Antilles, but is also constitutive of the, coloni of the coloniality of power across colonies. <laughs> next colonies. In the Mexican context, the colonial experience similarly uh, created a cultural symbolic order through, for example, historical and religious narrative that supported whiteness as a preferred signifier of privileged social identity. This cultural symbolic order was not entirely replaced or eliminated through independence, revolution, or the revolution's institutionalized cultural projects. Instead, these movements merely qualified the terms of white superiority through subsequent discourses of modernity. Although Mexican historian Jose Jorge Gomez Izquierdo does not refer specifically to Fanon, his own study of how Mexican history books teach about indigenous cultures brings him to a similar conclusion. 
their discourses serve the purposes of white supremacy in Mexico, aligning the pupil with the non-Indigenous subject, which results in psychological and emotional damage. So I'm just going to pause here briefly um, to explain what we're looking at and its relevance to the book. Um, and so as I discussed at the very beginning, Essentially, I'm, I'm trying to talk about the, the tension between two ideological formations, right? So obviously, all of you will be very familiar with Mexican muralism, right? It's probably the most visible, well-known example of um, sort of state-sponsored post-revolutionary cultural projects, right? And of course, we have, uh, as many of you will know, uh, a representation of Diego Rivera's sort of three, his, his trinity, right, of the soldier, um, the worker, and the campesino. Um, and there's obviously an exaltation of mestizo and indigenous bodies in this type of artistic endeavor. And so we're looking here at um, a work from 1926. And so I'm juxtaposing this with a cartoon that I found from 1927. And the reason I juxtapose them in the book is because it really gets at the fact that this state-sponsored discourse doesn't necessarily penetrate entirely norms and attitudes about um, aesthetics and who deserves to be represented and venerated for their physical appearance. So in this cartoon, to just explain what's taking place, there's an indigenous woman who brings her child to a beauty contest for children, right? Um, and the judge, the, the title of the cartoon is Buen Juez, the good judge. So the judge looks at the woman and basically asks, why have you brought this hideous child to this beauty contest for children? And she says, uh, because Don Diego, Don Diego Rivera is one of the judges. And he answers, well, what does that have to do with anything, right? So here we're seeing precisely this conflict. We have a state discourse that is saying that these bodies are aesthetically venerable, but then we have in this cartoon, a judge who is articulating the idea that just because that state sponsored discourse is being disseminated, it, it isn't necessarily persuading the whole of society in terms of what aesthetically venerable bodies should be, right? And who deserves to be represented and how. In light of a history of highly racialized social attitudes, I suggest that whiteness, blancura, is also dominant in Mexican cultural production and in Mexican cinema specifically, because in the context of colonized subjectivity, physical whiteness functions as a device for inciting identification between the spectator and the main characters in the diegesis or story worlds. Leading roles, the primary point of identification for audiences in narrative cinema, are therefore almost exclusively played by actors who can conform to the physical boundaries of Mexican whiteness. And this is especially true in the realm of melodrama, because it is a mode of representation that requires identification in order to produce pathos. Leading roles, um, so the primary point of identification for audiences in narrative cinema are therefore almost exclusively played by actors who can conform to the physical boundaries of Mexican whiteness. Furthermore, Blancura functions as a kind of passport for aspiring media figures, because according to the logic of colonization of subjectivity, physical whiteness qualifies them as deserving centrality and attention. In this way, several stars in Mexico and throughout the Americas who originally lacked substantive blanquitud were able to capitalize and enhance their blancura, their physical whiteness, while presenting their lower class affinity as charm or relatability, allowing them to rise to prominence in still racist societies. Figures who have benefited from playing what I call this whiteness game include Pedro Infante in Mexico, Eva Perón in Argentina, Carmen Miranda in Brazil, and Marilyn Monroe in the United States. Specifically, within story worlds dealing with non-elite sectors of society, whiteness functions as the colonially determined glue that allows a broad sector of Mexican society to identify with and desire characters who have stigmatized social identities because whiteness interpolates and appeals to spectators on the basis of their shared colonized desire and subjectivity. Or to put it another way, the whitening of marginalized sectors, social sectors in Mexican melodrama is their visual re-semanticization through the hegemonic code. And that's Jesus Martí Barbero's wording um, with that phrase that I'm applying here. 
according to which white bodies are valuable and desirable. If, as Mexican anthropologist Roger Bartra has argued, a specific formula is needed to produce the, quote, transposition of some selected aspects of lower class struggles and feelings to the domain of national culture, then I argue that with regard to Mexican cinema, whiteness, blancura, is that formula's key ingredient. For instance, it is through whiteness that a representation of the urban working class, Pepe el Toro, played by Pedro Infante in the 1948 film, Nosotros los Pobres, becomes one of the most cherished characters in all of Mexican film history. This was the most frequently screen screened film in the 20th century in Mexico. It is also through whiteness that melodramatic indigeneity works to endear itself to spectators through the faces of Dolores del Rio and Maria Felix, among many others. While scholars have already observed the ways in which film production from the golden age fulfilled a hegemonic role, helping to fashion Mexican spectators into national subjects, it bears mentioning that indigenous themed films in particular were charged with specific meanings and missions because of the significance of cinema as a medium that was uniquely associated with modernity. International recognition of Mexican films was one way in which after the revolution, whose armed phase lasted from 1910 to 1920, the nation sought to proclaim its arrival as a sophisticated peer among North American and Western European countries. Through their participation in the modern art form of cinema, Mexican filmmakers sought to be recognized in international contexts as producers of films that were both exemplars of artistic quality and identifiably Mexican. Mexican films about indigeneity are therefore rich spaces in which the search for Mexican singularity and external recognition, the, real, the, the racialized, racialized associations between indigeneity and backwardsness at home and abroad, and the national aspiration to be modern are all carefully negotiated. But to which iteration of modernity does this white Mexican body masqueraded as indigenous correspond? When tasked with representing an indigeneity that is both modern and desirable, 20th century cultural producers resort to using the visage of the first project of Western modernity introduced in what is now Mexico, an Iberian physical schema. By this point, Iberianness was sufficiently inscribed in local society and displaced from a global hegemonic position, having become the decayed alter ego of Anglo-US imperialism after, 19, uh, after 1898, so as to be associated with Mexican tradition vis-a-vis -vis looks disseminated from Western Europe and the United States. At the same time, a physical appearance that connoted Iberianness was still superior to the indigenous physical schemata within a Eurocentric worldview. For this reason, the Iberian physical schemata, the darkest variant of Mexican whiteness, became the canvas of choice um, onto which indigeneity could be layered on through folkloric embellishment. This visual code will define whiteness as indigeneity in cinema throughout the 20th century with many white Mexican actresses transforming themselves physically into indigenous characters simply by wearing long, dark braids. Of course, it is important to keep in mind that the stars who would embody Mexican whiteness on screen were able to do so because they conformed to the contextual and ambiguous nature of Mexican whiteness. As other scholars have already observed, many of these same actors, such as Lupe Velez and Dolores del Rio, who are the two uh, actresses I'll be speaking about today, were cast as ethnic others within Hollywood's distinct Anglo-American Protestant construct of whiteness. According to Richard Dyer, Hollywood's, in Hollywood's racial framework, what he calls Latin whites are more sexual and prone to, quote, anything that can be characterized as low, dark, and irremediably corporeal. End of quote. In this sense, during their US careers, Vélez and Del Rio operated as incarnations of what Maria de Guzman has called off-whiteness in referring to the liminal positionality 
that Spaniards and their descendants in the Americas occupy within the US racial formation and cultural imagination, precisely because they incarnate a deposed project of empire and modernity vis-a-vis -vis that of the US after 1896. Regarding indigenous themed films, uh, Mexican whiteness as indigeneity is an instance in which, as Ana M. Lopez has articulated when writing about the representation of women in golden age cinema, conflicting voices and needs visibly erupt into the cinematic and social sphere. Right? So the trope doesn't just do one thing, it does multiple things depending on how it's wielded. Whiteness as indigeneity functions as a solution to an aesthetic challenge raised by the shift in the official ideology regarding Mexican national identity after the revolution. Whiteness as indigeneity operates as a palimpsest of discourses. Beneath are the racialized vestiges of the colonial symbolic order that have not been entirely erased by the revolution and continue to privilege whiteness. Above is the new state-sponsored discourse urging Mexicans to value indigenous people and, and um, uh, campesinos as worthy national subjects as part of the country's cultural revolution. Or to use the vocabulary of Raymond Williams, we're seeing the relationship between the residual and the emergent. In this way, the use of whiteness for representing indigeneity before, after, and during the golden age operates as a hegemonic maneuver and sophisticated colonially inflected semiotic trick that splits the visual and narrative planes of cinema in order to facilitate the national and personal appropriation of indigeneity precisely through the glorification of, of, of whiteness as understood and constructed in the local Mexican context. Through racial masquerade, whiteness as indigeneity is a tool for impelling spectators toward varied ideological positions regarding the place of the native in national culture. So I'm going to now um, take a sip of water and <laughs> also transition to the examples. So I'm going to discuss one particular film from chapter two, which is titled Taming La Tehuana, which discusses a film that Lupe Velez, Lupe Velez's first film in Mexico, um, in which she plays a woman from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the women of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, Tehuanas, drew attention from both international visitors to the region and domestic cultural figures. Historian, Ajit Sluis has noted that cultural production from both centuries uh, participated in the creation of what she calls the Camposcape, an idealization of the countryside as, quote, a site of national authenticity, origin, and beauty, in which the Tehuana emerged as an ambiguous figure who embodied seduction, unbridled female sexuality, independence, beauty, and strength, but also represented the soul of Southern indígena Mexico, right? This is the mythology that was constructed around the Tehuana. Mexican cinema's uh, golden age representation of the Tehuana, therefore, had to contend with a pre-existing mythology about the regional type that contained elements that were at odds with the conventions of ideal womanhood in mid 20th century Mexican melodrama. As Ana Lopez reminds us, Mexican cinema produced between the 1930s and the 1950s, quote, was family entertainment by design and by commercial imperatives broader based, end of quote. This required, among other things, a careful management of the representation of sexuality and desire. So here I explore how one Tehuana themed film created with the commercial and, industri and industrial thrust of the golden age La Sandunga, directed by Fernando de Fuentes in 1938, tempers aspects of this type's earlier representation to generate a non-threatening cinematic regional type for broad consumption. In this process of refashioning, Mexican whiteness plays a key role in the creation of a Tehuana that functions as a desirable woman, physically and romantically, and as a compelling melodramatic character in the local context. <laughs> La Sandunga takes place in the town of San Lorenzo on the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and tells the story of a young Tehuana Lupe who is in love with a sailor from Veracruz, Juancho, who is played by Arturo de Córdoba. The film's dramatic tension revolves around a local endogamous custom 
dictating that Tehuanas cannot couple with men who are not from the town, a norm which threatens Lupe and Juancho's union. When Juancho leaves the Isthmus to make money so that he can marry Lupe, another local man from the town, Ramon, courts her. Fearing that she has been abandoned, Lupe succumbs to the pressure from her friends and family and agrees to marry Ramon. However, Juancho manages to return in the nick of time to reunite with Lupe. So in the nick of time being a conceit, of course, of melodrama, which um, according to its theorists, rests heavily on the dynamics of time. La Sandunga's Camposcape visualizes the Tehuana through whiteness as indigeneity, particularly through the on-screen presence of the film's protagonist, Lupe, played by the star actress Lupe Vélez. In order to unpack the layers of meaning at work in Vélez's interpretation of this role, one must consider the nature of her star persona in Mexico. Working in Hollywood during the late 1920s, Vélez was sometimes treated as a problematic incarnation of Mexican womanhood by the Mexican press in relation to traditional norms regarding class, gender, and the appropriate performance of Mexican identity. Her behavior was perceived as being characteristic of the lower class, vulgar, and indicating a lack of culture. This characterization was even more prominent when compared to Dolores del Rio, a contemporary Mexican actress also working in Hollywood, whose star text associated her with aristocracy, refinement, and morality. Furthermore, the Mexican press accused Vélez of being unfavorably Americanized and therefore unpatriotic. Finally, Vélez challenged traditional gender norms for women in Mexico, embracing independence, sexual freedom, due to which she was cast as a negative influence on Mexican women. Although Vélez was criticized on many fronts, she still possessed an important form of capital that allowed her to work both in Hollywood and in Mexico and be considered a beauty icon in her home country. Vélez had an appearance that was coded as white in Mexico, blancura, even if she did not originally possess some of the aspects of a white socioeconomic identity in Mexico, blanquitud, such as affluence and an aristocratic pedigree, as was the case with Del Rio. In addition to her physical blancura, Vélez's successful film career in Hollywood did imbue her with another form of blanquitud, the type that Bolívar Echeverria understands as productivity and wealth derived from participation in capitalist production wedded to modern technology. The following advertisement, which appeared in the newspaper El Universal Ilustrado on June 13, 1929, illustrates the centrality of Vélez's white identity, blancura, and her connection to the motion picture industry, Blanquitud, for the purpose of selling a beauty cream in Mexico. The text of the advertisement makes clear that Vélez is a model of beauty because of her skin color. It also casts Lupa's endorsement of the product within a national framework by mentioning that the cream protects her complexion in the different environments within the Mexican Republic, keeping it deliciosamente blanco, fresco y juvenil, deliciously white, fresh, and youthful. Furthermore, the fact that here Vélez appears, quote, wearing nothing but a Spanish shawl, end of quote, which is Joanna Hirschfield's reading of this image, hints that her Mexican whiteness may be linked to Spanish origins, or at the very least that it allows her to carry off a Spanish look. By emphasizing that Vélez possesses a skin, light skin, uh, a mark of feminine beauty in Mexico, again, according to Hirschfield, in a manner that also inscribes her as a Mexican national subject with potential ties to Spanishness, the advertisement reveals that although in the US, Vélez was constructed as an ethnic other against a US wasp notion of whiteness, in her home country, she was able to participate in white Mexican womanhood and to profit from its privileges. The fact that Vélez's whiteness, blancura, is a component of her attractiveness in stardom would seemingly conflict with the parameters of the role she plays in La Sandunga, in which the actress is meant to incarnate an exotic Southern and indigenous Mexican woman. However, instead of merely focusing on the ideas of incompatibility and conflict, I argue that Lupez's whiteness as indigeneity functions as a hegemonic maneuver meant to impel Mexican spectators toward the admiration and emotional connection to a regional type in order to nationalize the Tehuana. La Sandunga produces the protagonist's whiteness as indigeneity in multiple ways. Among them, the protagonist's embodied on-screen presence closely follows classic uh, studio cinema's visual parameters for leading female characters. Lupe appears in the form of a tall, slender body with light skin, large eyes, full made-up lashes, visible eyeshadow, thin manicured eyebrows, and lipstick. 
The character's indigeneity is layered on through folkloric costume, hairstyles, and through a peppering of Spanish anachronisms in her speech. Naiden, right, like we all, Casorio, all these words. Um, furthermore, on multiple occasions, the film produces Lupe's to be looked atness through three point lighting and the use of the soft focus lens. While at key moments, while, uh, while at key moments uh, make her entire head appear to radiate light. In this sense, La Sandunga deploys the conventions through which, according to Richard Dyer, cinema has visually idealized white female beauty. As he explains throughout the history of film, quote, idealized white women are bathed and permeated by light. It streams through them and falls on them from above. In short, they glow, right? The light within or from above appears to suffuse the body, end of quote. Lupe's whiteness, as, as glorified by studio-era lighting conventions, is a manifestation of race beauty standards for women in commercial Mexican cinema. Furthermore, her whiteness functions as the key factor through which La Sandunga manifests the Tehuana, not only as a beautiful ornament, the way in which indigenous Tehuanas from the Isthmus had been photographed in Mexico since the 19th century, but also as a worthy object of aesthetic and romantic desire for a broad Mexican audience. La Sandunga also modifies other aspects of the Tehuana's characterization in cultural production from the 19th and early 20th centuries, such as her uh, mythical, right, invented uh, ideas of her casual attitudes toward nudity and sexuality. For instance, the costumes that the actresses playing Tehuanas wear in the film appear to be inspired by a 19th century version of the local dress made according to Porphyrian and Victorian fashion sensibilities, which included European lace, ruffles, petticoats, and velvet. The modest nature of the regional vestments presented in the film contrast greatly with various uh, earlier representations of Tehuana clothing, including Claudio Linati's 1830 lithograph of the regional type, journalist Cuba Bonifant's 1921 description of Tehuana's, quote, dark skin, fresh and throbbing under clear silks and pale ribbons showing through their white transparent trajes, end of quote, and famously, Sergei Eisenstein's display of a bare-breasted Tehuana lounging outdoors with complete nonchalance in his 1932 film, Que Viva Mexico. In particular, the scene in which a fully dressed Lupe lounges on a hammock invites comparisons with the one when Concepcion in Eisenstein's film similarly rests outside, but nude from the waist up. Most likely the cinematic depiction of the Tehuana's scanty traditional dress would have been considered scandalous, especially on a white Mexican actress, and almost certainly would have hampered the distribution and exhibition of a commercial film like La Sandunga. By opting for a modest version of Tehuana dress, the film tempers the regional type for the broadest possible con uh, commercial consumption, while still referencing some aspects of the previously established iconography used to represent her. This attenuated golden age representation of the Tehuana follows a similar pattern to that of Mario Moreno's version of the urban Lumpen proletariat male type, El Pelado. Critics and scholars have demonstrated how Moreno's character Cantinflas incrementally revised the pelado, transforming his meaning in the national cultural imaginary from that of a potential threat to being one of the best loved, represent best loved representatives of Mexican identity at home and abroad. La Sandunga similarly refashions the Tehuana, creating a version of the regional type that is compatible with patriarchal, racist, and nationalist values, and in so doing, the film illustrates how cinema participated in the extraction and transformation of the regional figure into a less controversial national symbol. So I'm going to transition to an example from another chapter of the book, uh, which is titled Revolutionary Politics Colonized Aesthetics. Um, so as you can see, this chapter actually analyzes a number of films, and for today, I've decided to just discuss probably the most well-known example up here, Maria Candelaria, precisely to be able to have a conversation with you. Um, okay. Yes. 
Emilio Fernandez's 1944 film, Maria Candelaria, is among the most widely studied and commented on in Mexican film history, because, at least in part, of its iteration of the indigenismo and mestizaje discourse and its visual genealogy. In this bona fide golden age melodrama, it is the incongruity among different sectors of the population in pre-revolutionary Mexico that leads to a tragic outcome. So briefly, although I know a lot of us know this, the film tells the story of Maria Candelaria, played by Dolores del Rio, an indigenous woman from Xochimilco, who is ostracized from her community uh, because of her mother's reputation for transgressing the community's sexual norms. By selling flowers, she hopes to repay her debt to a mestizo strongman, Don Damian, and marry her beloved Lorenzo Rafael, played by Pedro Armendariz. However, the community does not allow her to sell flowers, and later Maria contracts malaria. In a moment of desperation, her betrothed steals the medicine for Maria, as well as a dress for her to wear on the wedding day, which eventually lands him in jail. In exchange for helping Maria negotiate Lorenzo Rafael's release, a criollo artist asks to paint her. After painting her face, the artist requests to paint her new body, to which Maria reacts by running away in distress. Although he completes the painting using the nude body of another indigenous woman, as is his model, Maria's community in interprets the resulting image as evidence of her sexual immorality, for which they stone her to death. By featuring, although in a highly romanticized vein, the plight of indigenous people and attributing that suffering to a lack of competent mediation among the various sectors of the population, Maria Candelaria points to the necessity of the revolution of 1910 and justifies the governing order that resulted from it. Making corporatist government the film's structuring absence, Maria Candelaria, like many other Latin American studio era films, promotes it as an alternative order for modernizing society. The racialized semiotic dynamic of whiteness as indigeneity serves in the film to anchor the spectator's identification with Maria and Lorenzo Rafael as the melodrama's tragic characters, quintessential Mexicans who are orphans of a competent modern state with whom the spectator is meant to identify, right? So this is not just happening in Maria Candelaria. One of the fundamental arguments of this chapter is that the code of having that central main character represented through whiteness as indigeneity as being the ideal Mexican subjects is something we can see in the 1930s, right? And all the way through various examples. Visually, as Dolores Tierney has perceptively explained, the film's use of lighting brightens Maria's appearance in a manner that is consistent with Western visual conventions, according to which a woman's appeal is rendered through luminosity. In addition to the film's lighting, Maria Candelaria also uses whiteness as indigeneity in the somatic sense to convey diegetic indigenous feminine desirability, thereby also reinscribing a colonized hierarchy of female bodies, even as the film advocates for the dismantling of internal colonial social and political relations in Mexico. In contrast to earlier Golden Age movies, Fernandez's films take full advantage of the more advanced technology available in Mexico by the mid 1940s to aestheticize racial masquerade through elaborate filmic techniques. In Maria Candelaria, these techniques put forth clearer differentiations between the desirability of whiteness as indigeneity and that of other diegetically indigenous females throughout the film. For instance, Maria Candelaria establishes the protagonist's exceptional desirability by presenting her to the spectator through the desirous gaze of male characters, thus cementing her to be looked atness from their perspective. When the artist first sees Maria, an eyeline match from his perspective displays her as an object of wonder and captures his reaction as he gasps in astonishment. As Laura Mulvey has illustrated, camera language of this kind places the spectator into the position of desire for the fetishized woman, inciting the viewer to do the same, or at least inviting her to do the same. Only Maria, the white as indigenous woman, provokes this kind of reaction or is presented through editing in a manner that suggests her appeal for men in the diegesis. While the breach of indexicality in the casting of Maria Candelaria is remarked upon by nearly every scholar and critic who has written about the film in the last 30 years, at the time the film was released, some Mexican press coverage both made it clear that Dolores del Rio was not herself an indigenous woman, but also foregrounded nationalism to praise del Rio's appropriateness for the role. The title of an article that appeared in Cinema Reporter in February of 1944 hints at the complex logic behind this view of Del Rio's performance. 
So the title is in English, right? From R Ramona to Maria Candelaria. Lolita loves indigenous Mexican women. Lolita is now ours. So it's quite a title. Okay, on the one hand, this article, complete with glamorous photographs of the interview on which it is based, reifies the distance between the Rio star persona and the indigenous Mexican woman. It casts Del Rio as a highly refined and delicate woman, even to the point of suggesting that the filming requirements for Maria Candelaria were challenging because her, quote, physical constitution is not made for roughness, end quote. On the other hand, the article crafts a celebratory narrative in which Maria Candelaria constitutes Del Rio's inhabiting Mexicanidad. In this narrative, during Del Rio's time in Hollywood, Quote, she was lost to the Mexican people, end of quote. This alienation from her home country is paralleled in her interpretation of the leading role in the film Ramona, directed by Edwin Carew in 1928, in which she played a half indigenous woman just after the US incursion into Mexican California. The article presents Del Rio's Ramona as removed from Mexican authenticity by referring to the character as, quote, that other little Indian woman fabricated in Hollywood, end of quote. The article's narrative turns when it presents Del Rio's absence from her homeland as the impetus for her love of indigenous Mexican women. In Del Rio's words, quote, Indian problems have always interested me. I feel a great affection for the little Indian women of Mexico. Their great little tragedies matter to me. I learned to appreciate all of that thanks to the years I was away." End of quote. As a promotional piece for Maria Candelaria, this article casts Del Rio's interpretation of the leading, leading role in Fernandez's Mexican production as the embodiment of her newfound esteem for, Mexican, uh, for indigenous Mexican women and the inhabiting of her authentic Mexicanness in contrast to her period of alienation from the nation and Hollywood. Through this logic, the text elevates the repatriated del Rio into, quotes, propiamente la intérprete ideal de la India Mexicana, truly the ideal interpreter of indigenous Mexican women, women, sorry, of the indigenous Mexican women, end of quote. In other words, the article focuses on Hollywood as a categorically un-Mexican environment in order to collapse the chasmic differences among Mexican women and praise del Rio as the quintessential embodiment of Mexican female indigeneity. Maria Candelaria and films like it articulated a break with the multifaceted injustices of internal colonialism by bolstering revolutionary discourses. However, at the same time, they appeal to the colonization of subjectivity and desire, employing whiteness as indigeneity to solicit compassion for virtuous diegetically indigenous women and corroborate their diegetic attractiveness according to a Eurocentric standard. In this way, filmic indigenista melodramas from the post-revolutionary 20th century carried with them clearly gendered vestiges of coloniality. So to conclude, it is through the colonization of desire and subjectivity that we arrive at a situation in Mexico in which the national audiovisual repertoire has painted an overwhelmingly and unrealistically white picture of the country. Although the dynamics are different with respect to the US context, the ubiquity of whiteness on screen has also been a tool of white supremacy in Mexico. Indeed, it is one of the most powerful manifestations of what anthropolo anthropologist Guillermo Bonfil Batalla has termed el México imaginario the imaginary Mexico, which he defines as, quote, a minority country organized according to norms, aspirations, and intentions of Western civilization, that sector that incarnates and impels the dominant project in our country, end of quote. Clearly, to apply one of Bell Hooks's observations, Mexico is not as white as it wants to be. And so we return to the bewildered European or US American spectator, who upon encountering Mexican films and telenovelas for the first time cannot help but ask, why is everyone so white? I have often heard many Mexicans react indignantly to this kind of question, and I have done so myself. We have white people too, the response goes, beneath which one can read, we have beauty, civilization, and modernity too. But like children and drunks who unwittingly reveal uncomfortable truths, those who ask the ingenuous and sometimes prejudice question, reveal the fantasy 
for what it is, an aspirational and unconvincing mask. Thank you. Yeah, here. Sorry. Yeah, good. yeah, the camera is good. The so we have some time, I would say there's plenty of time to have a conversation uh, with Monica and also to ask her uh, questions and to share comments. So I am not sure how we are, because probably there's also some. So maybe uh, we can start with some questions in the in the room. If there are any, Rodrigo has one, and then we will jump in. Yeah. And if I have, if we have time, I will also ask. Yeah, if you can tell me like your name and also, you know, kind of like your whether you're a student or faculty or fellow, you know, yes, I'd like so to I'm know. Rodrigo I'm a postdoc okay. in the American Indian Studies Center. Okay. So one, and I do I'm a linguist. So one aspect of the masquerade that you mentioned very briefly was in the language used by the, the actors and actresses. So you mentioned anachronism, so yeah. basically some vocabulary that's used to signal yeah. the masquerade. But I'm, something that always stood out to me very clearly about something like Maria Candelaria is the, the dialect masquerade that mm -hmm. uh, Dolores del Rio and Pedro Mendales are doing. Yeah. So I was wondering if you can comment on that in contrast to maybe other performers who don't Absolutely. use language in the same way, maybe yeah. Columba Dominguez, correct? Struck me as somebody who wouldn't go that far yes. in using language to a degree. And of course, we can talk about the different uh, roles that Columbo Dominguez play versus uh, yes. so maybe some, some thoughts. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, of course, I had to be selective. Um, language is something that I, I, I do my best to be attentive to. One of the most interesting um, sort of discoveries of this study for me was, um, you know, on the one hand, that there is something I think that. Um, uh, the, the, the linguist that you invited recently, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So she yes. has co she has coined this el effecto piso, right? Mm -hmm. And like, yes, that is one manifestation of like aural indigeneity, right? But there are many others that happen. There are many other strat strategies that are used. Um, for instance, um, one of the films I discuss. Um, you know, and, and it is not just particular to, to this particular film, but there's a film called Citari by uh, Miguel Contreras Torres, very early, it was like just between sound, just between silent and sound film. Um, and in this, the way in which indigenous people are presented is very much kind of almost presenting them as like classical figures that can be, you know, compared to, you know, Romans or Greece. And what you have in the, in this case, in the intertitles, the version of the blog that was, was in, I, yeah, I didn't have much stuff, the intertitles, it is very much trying to do the opposite, right? Trying to somehow linguistically elevate them. Um, and so they use like bosophics, right? Which is not a feature of 20th century Mexican Spanish. Um, so there are there are several, you're absolutely correct. There, there is the effect of this up. There is also another landscape of multiple strategies. Um, and I think you're right, like linguistically, that is how you know we go back to when I had the sort of the representation of the indigenous mob and then the white as indigenous people, and then the characters who are presented as being. Creo yoga painter and the and the priest, yeah, that is definitely happening uh, on a linguistic level. Um, so I do write about Columba Dominguez uh, in this same chapter, in chapter three, um, and she, when she is cast as indigenous, for example, in Macrobia, my my you know I'm not a linguist, but my what I was hearing was also kind of stepping into uh, an effect of this a little bit, um, but when she is you know, for example, in Pueblerina, but she's playing there a mestiza. She's not playing an indigenous person. She's she's obviously adjusting her speech to to not be indexed in that way. So yes, very complex linguistic landscape of, of what is happening. Yes. I'm gonna pick up two questions that actually it was the question that I had. Mm -hmm. And there are two questions from members of the audience that are at Zoom Absolutely. that are related. So I'm going to put them Great. like both Great. together because they're kind of interrelated but that have different nuances. So the first one comes from uh, Ileana Villegas. Uh, Ileana says, wonderful talk, thank you. How do you reconcile or respond to recent criticism of movements such as Poder Prieto, right? Stating that we, and she, she clarifies Mexicans, right, mm -hmm. are adapting a US racial dilemma. Yeah. That racism doesn't exist, only colorism and classism redundant at best, and that we are one race, the mistakes. Absolutely. Do you talk about that in your book? Mm -hmm. What's your intake? Thanks and congratulations. There's a related 
a related question from a, from another person, but I think they're very kind of interrelated. So I'm going to put them together. I think that's a that's a good thing for you to uh, for you to respond together. This one comes from Beatriz Rivas, and she asks, uh, "Does the casting of Janitza Aparicio in Roma mm -hmm. and Presencias and of Mabel Cadenas and the Noche Huerta in Wakanda Forever represent a change slash progress in race and beauty standards in Mexico, mm -hmm. or is it simply a projection on behalf of the U.S. pop culture?" Uh, attempting okay. to grapple with or superficially doubling in trending colorism slash race issues are mexico's race beauty standards changing or not <laughs> okay. yeah thank, thank you so much for being with us um online um so yeah one of the major challenges to this project was precisely that uh you know the ideology of mestizaje is extremely robust um however uh I always knew to be true that there are levels of Mexican society that cannot be legislated, right, or are outside of how far ideological projects, racial ideological projects can reach. And those areas are precisely the areas of beauty and desire, right? Um, which is why I'm working with this corpus and with this type of, of dynamic. And cinema is a particularly illustrative space because obviously there's an economic results in terms of which which the way in which beauty and desire are, are used right they they often succeed in in you know making films um visible and and significant when star power is sort of channeled successfully um so luckily for me um at the time so i uh, began writing my dissertation from which the project was eventually developed um, in, in 2014, 2015, um, it was defended in 2016. And luckily for me, my work on this project has coincided with a, the work of many social scientists. Um, so although people in, in my particular field were not publishing effusively on whiteness, social scientists in Mexico and Brazil have been, and I actually ended up presenting with them at LASA, publishing with them on the, in the, um, what was it, Lass's mm -hmm. journal. Um, and so, uh, and in particular, there's a vaccine anthropologist working in the United States, um, Hugo Serranaya, who has a beautiful ethnography of Mexican golf courses in which, you know, so these people, even though they're not in my field, gave me many tools and a very robust bibliography with which to answer people who say like, you're in the US Academy, stop imposing you know, your racial problems onto our country. Um, and I also come, you know, my parents are from Mexico. I was, you know, I have a complicated backstory, but I, I have spent a lot of time in the country as well, right? So um, with, in, in, you know, so with that bibliography, I was able to sort of say, well, these people, you know, and of course there's, for example, a fantastic book, Mexico Racista, um, uh, by Federico Navarro de Linares, right? So th these things are emerging, even if not. Um, and so, and also, you know, when when one is trying to do a dissertation or a book, you you have to decide what your goals are. And for me, you know, there, these are twenty films. It's three decades. Like, I'm not making this up. <laughs> you know, like the evidence, the evidence is robust to the point that, you know, there may be ways in which aspects of the book could be repetitive, but. If that's a criticism that's wielded for me, that's a compliment because I just very much wanted to say, this is real. <laughs> I'm not making it up. It's a lot of films. It's not one director. It's not one studio. It's not one period. This is a problem. It's a logic. It's a way of relating to bodies on screen and bodies in society, right? Um, and so I think just like to respond to, to this question, um, just like coming with a preponderance of evidence, you know, there's a point at which it cannot be ascribed to you as someone with a bias, right? So combining both just a very uh, wide and exhaustive filmography with social scientists uh, corroborating, for me, that was the strategy that I chose in order to address this idea of, you know, we are mestizos, we are proud of it, we don't have any problems. Um, and yes, so interestingly, when I was writing the introduction to this book the first time, um, it was when Roma came out, 
Um, and so in the, in the introduction, the first few pages of the book, I do talk about Roma and that line about the virulence with which it is defended that came directly just from seeing like the social media hatred, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that, that rained down upon, um, upon the actors in, in that film, w. Um, and also in, you know, as scholars, many times it, it is helpful to have reminders that your work, it needs is relevant, you know, and for me, that was one of those. I was like, oh my gosh, if this is 20, what year were we in? 20, 20, 20, 2018. And, and the amount of hatred, right? And, and that's also where I decided, you know, the idea of protagonism is extremely important because it was the fact that she was so central. It's the fact, and it's the cinema, a lot of the criticisms of that film were, you know, oh, she doesn't speak. And I was like, hello, cinematography, she, he is obligating you to stare at her for that long. And that is the point. You're so, you need to look at her. We're not going to let you not look at her the way that you are, you know, sort of allowed to ignore her and people like her in society, right? And in cinema, right? Because people like her don't show up, right? So, um, so what I think in terms of, is there being progress? Um, there's an, there's an interesting dynamic, um, which of course, like scholars of, of, Latino, Latina, Latinx cinema have, have written about for years, which is the fact that um, light skin, light hair, light eye, Latinos in Latinas, Latinx people in Hollywood are illegible and don't do quite as well because um, the sort of whiteness that is celebrated in Latin America is not um, legibly Latino to a US audience. And so they end up kind of paradoxically, they're the whiteness that they are accustomed to receiving um, a lot of privilege based on doesn't doesn't really work in the in the visual racial logic of the U.S. racial formation as mediated in this country, um, and so what I think is that the Mexican media is kind of being shamed <laughs> into having to get see more space to to uh, Mexicans of color um, because of of these conversations, right, um, and also like. Let's not be naive. It's also economic. Absolutely. Someone like Dinoch Huerta, like he can open up the, the, the markets of, of Latin America in a way that, that other folks could not. So I do think it is progress. I do think there's pressure coming from the United States. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. If, if the result is that people who are, are getting space who otherwise would not be receiving that space. Um, is it changing? That's very hard to 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 assess, but um, I, at least I think that it is less acceptable to uh, have like all white Mexican casts. I think at least now people are starting to realize that like that is not acceptable in any way. So in yeah. So in terms, would you say that in terms of like Raymond Williams that you used in the mm -hmm. book, uh, would you say that that film? is doing things or contemporary film nowadays and contemporary media can do things to push an emergence racial formation, which is different or not necessarily. I think, I think that it is trying to change the images of things perhaps in a, in a top-down way that feels inauthentic to people. And that is why they're saying like, this is a very US approach to the problem. Um, but I think is, is some is some progress better than no progress? Is it better to at least have some faces that are different looking? I mean, can we take the win sometimes? I think I think that um, it, is it better than what we had before? I think it is something. Is it perfect? No, I think it is something. I believe your book also illuminates conversations. We do not necessarily always that direction is U.S. to Mexico. I think your book illuminates conversations about dynamics of Latino and Latinx communities in the United States as well that are coming with that racial formation from Mexico, as unfortunately was, I think, made very clear in the infamous leak of the conversations of the City Hall, for example. I think your book also can illuminate a lot of you know, phenomena that do not necessarily happen only in Mexico, but happen also here. So that's yes. another way to look at those. Yes. You know, yeah. The direction no, and honestly, that, that was another objective of the book. Um, you know, the, the word Mexican in the United States is used in very peculiar ways, right? In some ways, it means Mexican national, someone who has, who's a citizen of Mexico, born in Mexico, or naturalized citizen. And I grew up um, 
in, in Texas. Uh, I was born in Puerto Rico, raised in Texas, where the word Mexican can mean a lot of things. It can mean like your great grandparents are from Mexico, or it means like people think that you look like your people were from, it could just mean so, you know, it can mean so many things, but it is a racialized, it's a racialized term, it, you know? Um, so for that reason, and also the way it's used in the U.S., it kind of flat because it's used as a as a racial term. Um, unfortunately, it's quite new sometimes to folks that within Mexico, there's a lot of racial diversity um, and notions of whiteness, constructs of whiteness, and those constructs of whiteness are not necessarily identical to the notion of whiteness that is used here. And that was really that's why I say the word local racial formation maybe like a thousand times in this book because if you. Mm -hmm. That is really the issue, right? Is you cannot simply take terms and apply them laterally to different places. You know, what who is considered of a certain racial category in one area, that will not be the case if we, you know, move them geographically uh, because those categories are socially constructed. So that was really one of the objectives um, is, is to complicate um, US notions of whiteness and and kind of, I guess, just caution folks to kind of be attentive to to the, the way the terms are used and understood in their specific locations and histories and colonial projects, right? Yeah. Thank you, Monica, for such a great presentation. It, it sparked a lot of ideas. One is, I wonder if you can share with us your thoughts about Emilio Fernandez, Emilio yeah. El Indio Fernandez, yeah. who was both an actor and a director. Yeah. And so you're talking, and, and it's fascinating that you focus on the uh, movie stars, but here's somebody who both was an actor, but also was um, behind the camera, and he was called El Indio. So I wonder what that signifier and yeah. what it meant for him to be identified as El Indio in yeah. this context. And I'm just thinking about his, you know, the La Rebelión de los Colgados, for yeah. example, mm -hmm. that uh, pushes the social commentary. I mean, this a melodramatic movie, but but also it's complicated. This, this screenplay is, you know, by US writer, right? Yeah. And so it's interesting. So just what, how, and he has such an interesting, compelling story. And did he, what was his role in terms of maybe taking advantage of this or pushing the boundaries of that? But but just the last, how can we use your frame also to, to apply to other uh, examples of these, um, the desire of what bodies? I'm thinking of as a Comandante Marcos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he appears as the face of the indigenous rebellion. And he is, you know, he's white, he's, he's a poet, and, uh, and he captures the imagination. And so everybody starts to like decide, do I like Marcos or <laughs> should I hate him? I mean, he yeah. seems to really put this desirability of the white body or the white voice mm -hmm. or representation upside down, right? I mean, in a way, it's like, okay, what? how can we think about the representation, but also the message, but also, you know, how were indigenous people using his voice and his image to convey and capture a larger audience? I don't know, I'm just speculating yeah. and maybe you can, uh, yes, yes. you can just uh, share your thoughts on that. So the, the question of that, the term, right, indio, right, el indio, um, you know, the valence of terms also shifts in time. So he, you know, as far as I know, mobilized it like self-consciously in in ways he attributed to a positive valence right um and you know actually for the, the last chapter of the book uh, is about men and i thought long and hard about whether to use the word indios right because today like that is not an acceptable term that is considered a racial slur but there th thankfully i was able to find like bibliographic references to show that you know in other times of the 20th century that was not necessarily automatically considered a racial slur and this is one example right for him it was very much part of his persona and for him i think it's you know obviously he was he was in hollywood he was here mm -hmm. he has his, his training in, in um in the, in the silent period here um that was the moment to use that discourse, right? The post-revolutionary moment, because at least as we talked about earlier, discursively, that was the time to mobilize that sort of label in order to gain um, space, opportunities, protagonism, right? Um, he, and he, of course, famously is quoted for saying, it's Mexicano soy yo, right? So like he very much like was self-consciously trying to 
create uh, Mexican cinema as a national artistic project that could be, and to his credit, I mean, if you look at the, the post-World War II um, uh, prestigious film festivals that we get, I mean, he was the only Mexican director at exhibiting his films at, at in those venues, right? So he did in many ways uh, succeed in uh, making Europeans aware of Mexican cinema. Um, and through what I think Jorge Ayala Blanco calls it, terrorismo plástico, right? Like just the, the dexterity of the, the formal qualities of the cinema that he, and of course, as Charles Ramirez Berg has, has told us, right? We really need to think about the team. We need to think about Gloria Schumann, his, the, the person who edited, was a woman, one of the few, you know, working at that time in, in Mexico. Um, and, uh, you know, Magdaleno, the script writer, and of course, Figueroa. Right, so when, when we can't just ascribe it all to to, to this. Um, and no, you're absolutely right that with La Revolución de los Colgados, like the, the, the strategy is not about pleasure. Like the films that I'm talking about are very much about kind of the seduction of, of the spectator in terms of inducing pleasure. La Revolución de los Colgados is, is, you know, what you're seeing is a lot of los colgados, right? A lot of, a lot of torture, a lot of physical pain, right? So it is more of a, a modern critique. Um, and I think that what is uniting your question about Emilio Fernandez and your question about Subcomandante Marcos, and we could even throw Frida Kahlo in there, is, <laughs> is a question sure, about, yes. about <laughs> protagonism, mm -hmm. which isn't a word, at, you know, with, when I was writing the book, you know, some of the people who read were like, this is a weird word. And I was like, well, of course, I was thinking of protagonismo in Spanish, so I looked up in the dictionary. I was like, no, this is a word, and it's an <laughs> it's a word, and it's actually a really important word for what I'm trying to say about the privilege of whiteness as giving you protagonismo in many ways, like just for free, just you know. And so I think that's what's at the heart of that question. Um, you know, I am not an expert on Subcomandante Marcos, but you know, we know he changed his name to Subcomandante Galeano precisely to try to diminish his protagonism in that space, which he himself found to be problematic. Um, but if the goal, you know, of the communities in Chiapas was to bring attention, then it, it, knowing the way Mexican racism works, if they needed a media figure, then it is not surprising that they would have needed a whiter media figure to be, um, you know, the visibility for them. So was it strategic or not? We would have to ask them, you know? <laughs> Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Monica, for a great talk. I'm curious that you did a great job of describing whiteness and indigeneity, but Mexican cinema, I assume, is exclusively it's all melodramas, it's all state sponsored, is that correct? Of, of these? Of the 20 films in your book. Um, yes, the vast majority, I mean, in terms of state sponsorship, one of the things that I try to do in the book is like, complicate a little bit the idea that, you know, kind of that comes, you know, kind of from the school of Frankfurt that like, okay, right. if this has any state sponsorship, mm -hmm. then this is complete indoctrination. Right. You know, the Paxton, there's a scholar's last name is Paxton. He does a, you know, does a good job of explaining how like, yes, there was funding, but it isn't as if though they were sort of 100% funded right. and this is just like a complete mouthpiece of the government. Right. Um, yeah, so, be, but because of the period of time, yes, some some government funding, and of course had to be attentive to, to censorship, right? So there were things that could not be done. So right. there, they, there was a, a have, they did have to be mindful of some sort of government right. surveillance, if you will, of, of okay. types of things being represented. Yeah. Okay, so the majority, but not exclusively, you would say, right? In terms of the funding, and of course- all, all, all had some, okay. yeah. So I guess I'm just curious about um, other films that were funded in other ways and in other yeah. spheres, yeah. And to what extent they reproduced this logic and what yeah. found. For example, Churros, right? The B films, which were yeah. ex almost exclusively funded private, mm -hmm. private funds. Indigenous film uh, from Mexico, and possibly, and really neoliberal, the, the neoliberal era, mm -hmm. are all three that are much more uh, funded without the state right. exclusively. So I'm just curious because it seems like a very compelling um, analysis that you've done. And I, I just wonder to what extent you've seen any other films from those three different types of areas and to what extent they, they reproduce or perhaps even yeah. problems. So let me just go back a couple of slides because in, in chapter three, counter -example. Yeah, I did, I do talk about two, just two counter examples. So right. obviously, um, um, 
Honey seal rights is, is completely, it's state sponsored, right? But it's under governance, right? So if you have an aesthetic that is very much trying to get away from the ideas of whoever um, that the like US um, studio system would have produced and in which some people in Mexico were trying to um, reproduce, right? Um, and so Raices is considered the first modern independent film of, of Mexico. Um, and of course, in a different aesthetic is being mobilized. It's a film that is, it is four shorts that they were put together um, in order to be a feature length film that could be taken to the festivals, right? Um, and the one of the segments, um, La Potranca, is the one that I analyze. And essentially, I argue that something very different is taking place. It's about a European archaeologist who is in Mexico, and he is essentially a, kind of a, becomes obsessed with trying to rape this indigenous girl. And the film, as opposed to uh, what I argue, ya me dirás tú, if you agree with me, um, what, what I argue is that the way that the cinematography and the editing work actually is trying to... Work, work. Uh -oh. Is this a car? Presentation. Uh, unfortunately, there's an emergency in the building. And we have to leave. So uh, this would conclude the uh, the broadcast of these. Do you have to access to your computer? So just be calm and maybe if you can use the stairs to go down and don't use the elevator. All the way down. Thank you.